We're joined now by one of the individuals that you're going to know the name. That's right. United States Senator John Tester from the great state of Montana. Senator, good to have you on. Joe, yeah. it's good. First off, let's settle a bet, okay. right? And All you right. can settle this for me, and there'll be no arguing with the people that uh, that I know. Tell people where a flat iron steak comes from on the critter. A flat iron steak. Yep. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We cut up meat for 20 years, and we made rib steak and sirloin steak and T-bone steak and club steak. We made round steak and cube round steak. I couldn't tell you where God dang flat iron steak And that's the argument I made. <laughs> that, you know, there's a man from Pizik right now that every time we go to the restaurant, he wants flat iron steak. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody knows what that is. So I just no, made money. But I will, I will tell you this. You give me a good rib steak. Oh, yeah. You're making me salivate right now. Let me just tell you, go to the Black Pelican in Weimar. You'll find really? a really good rib steak. All right. All right, let's talk a little ag. Uh, you know, yep. the farm bill's up. Yep. Uh, is this something that could even get done, or yes. is it just going to be an extension? So I think the since the, the default, the debt limit stuff is behind us now, it, that was really freezing up all the work on the committee because they didn't. Look, if, if, if we had defaulted on the debt, it would have been, it would have blown the farm bill out of the water. It would have blown everything out of the water. That didn't ha happen, thank God. Now I can tell you the farm bill is, they're working hard. Uh, Stabenow and Bozeman, the chairman and ranking member of that committee, are working hard to try to get it done. I talked to Senator Stabenow the other day, and she said, we really don't know if we're going to be able to get it done. Uh, we, we got a lot of things to negotiate, a lot of things to get through on the farm bill. It's a big bill, okay? And it only happens once every five years. And I said, look, uh, you just got to work as hard as you possibly can. By the way, this is the same as it applies for the appropriation bills. We're supposed to get our funding allotment, in other words, what we can fund to. I'm chair of the Defense Subcommittee on Appropriations. So we'll get that number. It'll be somewhere close to $900 billion for defense, but it's not going to be that number. It'll be something else. And then we have to mark that bill up to that number. In other words, we need to allocate dollars to the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, um, from that number very similar in a farm bill you know you've got you've got the farm bill you've got crop insurance you've got uh, you know the uh, reference prices you've got uh, the snap program all there's there's uh, uh, conservation programs equip and other things like that all that stuff costs money and so you have to um, you have to get together and negotiate and come up with a bill that's going to work for family farmers and keep our food security secure and and move move forward i think they'll be able to get it done by the end of september but it's going to require them to be committed to do that and we have gotten into a habit in washington dc far too often joel of just uh, you know wait until next month or wait till the first year we do a thing called a continuing resolution i don't think that's good business i don't think it gives business a certainty i don't think it gives families a certainty they need where if we get this done on time and it's just a matter of if you got people that want to obstruct and stop, then you try to minimize those folks. You negotiate. You find, try to find the sweet spot, thread the needle, and get the bill done. It's important for states like North Dakota and Montana. It's important for our food security. It's important for hungry kids. So we got to do it. we got to do it right. I'm always nervous a little bit about the farm bill coming up when commodity prices are good. Yep. You know, I've seen you advocate. I saw Colin Peterson advocate and others. Yep. Uh, you know, my big sister Heidi advocate. And when commodity prices are good and you go to the floor and make the argument, it's like nobody wants to help the same way. So... I love it when commodity prices are good because that puts less pressure on the government. And by the way, as a farmer, I'd rather get my check from the marketplace than the federal government any day of the week. That being said, the farm bill is there for a safety net. We deal with a lot of things. We deal with consolidated markets in agriculture, whether it's on the input side or the selling side. We, we deal with climate. And, you know, like right here, I, I landed here in, in, in Fargo, and you guys need a drink of water. Yeah. I mean, you need, you need some rain. We, for the last three weeks pretty good shape in north central montana but that means we're two weeks away from a drought ourselves okay yep. so weather is always playing a big role so we've got to make sure that the farm bill's there that works from a crop insurance standpoint that the reference price is a reasonable price um, moving forward and by the way uh, if it isn't then it takes away the ability for farmers to make it when prices are low but when our prices are good, we shouldn't need the farm program. In the way it's set up, we won't need the farm program when prices are good. But we still need that safety net there when prices drop or the weather turns on us. I want to talk a little bit about uh, something I know both of us are passionate about, and that's that's hunting. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were 
we were talking off air a little bit about CRP, how that ties in with the Farm Bill and others. But, yep. uh, you know, what's it look like? If you got a splash of rain, that isn't a bad sign for people like me that would love to come live in your state. No, it's uh, so what, what, what's transpired over the last decade or so is we've had a lot of acres of CRP go out. Look, when the CRP program was first established, I would have done it different than, than it, what it was done in the 80s. But nonetheless, what it resulted in is bird populations like we've never seen before, deer populations, antelope populations. Now, as we pull that CRP out, as it's been done over the last few decades, um, uh, you know, you're, you're going to see those bird numbers go down. Um, I will tell you that habitat's habitat, and you don't, you can't replace it with with anything other than grass habitat. If you don't have grass habitat, you're just not going to have the number of birds out there. And so. Even though it was done to protect highly erodible land when it was when it was first set up, the side benefit of that is a lot of game, a lot of wildlife, um, a lot of hunting opportunities. By the way, which brought in a different kind of economy into farm country than than raising wheat or corn or soy or whatever you might be raising. So, um, that's just kind of the way it is right now. The CRP program uh, it did cost the taxpayers some money. There was some benefit to it. Um, I would not, if you know, talk about when it was first set up, I would not let, allowed whole farms to go in. I think 35% of a county could vote in the CRP. I'd have said make that apply to the farms, and that way you'd have kept families on the land with it. But what was done was done, and we're living with it now, and it's resulted in some consolidation. But on the positive side, it's resulted in some darn good bird populations. I mean, we don't have many uh, as, as I wish, but, you know, I've never saw a sharp-tailed grouse till we had CRP, yeah. you know. Well, I, I know that a lot of people like me would like to come and get a piece of that. Yeah. You've long advocated for in-state hunters first, yeah, yeah, which, absolutely. which you should, yep. uh, which you should. I get yep. that. Are you still getting that kind of pressure? Because, you know, there's more and more people knocking on your door, and yet those in-state hunters are the ones that are paying the bill. Yeah, no, I, I think in-state in hunters should have first kick of the pops. There's a lot of folks that have real money, Joe. I mean, look, we're, we're blessed but we Other don't, we don't have real just... money. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, you got folks that got change in their pocket that could buy me. I'm yeah. telling you, they've got so much money. Those are the folks that are start you're starting to see coming to Montana, and they're starting to su replace, supplant our farmer, our farmers and ranchers, our hunters that want to go out there and 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 you know do a little fishing, do a little hunting. But but look, if it's set up right, there should be enough for everybody to go around. But it all starts with habitat. Habitat doesn't happen by accident. If you've got good habitat, clean water, clean air, you're going to have birds, you're going to have deer to hunt, you're going to have antelope, um, but you got to have the habitat. You know, I saved this one for last. You know, there's only so much time I get to steal. I get that. Uh, you're busy. But uh, you've been really passionate for years about veterans and yeah. uh, the men and women that serve this country in uniform. How are we doing nationally? Uh, it it feels at times like we're doing a, a better job. Like this administration gets it. You know, there's there's none of this uh, kind of the treatment of John McCain, the way yeah, he had yeah. been treated type yep. of a thing. How how are we doing? We're doing better. Still got a ways to go, but we're doing better. We're uh, the the VA is really focused on bringing on more doctors and nurses, and, and they're having successes in that. Um, in the mental health side of things, same thing. And I'm sure it's no different, particularly in Western North Dakota as it is in Eastern Montana. Or, you know, it's hard to find uh, mental health folks. You get in crisis, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. We're trying to do some stuff with that with broadband, trying to make sure there's somebody at the end of the hotlines when, they, when you call and you are in crisis. Uh, but look, it's better than it was. We still have a ways to go. We were at war in the Middle East for 20 years. These folks had multiple deployments. They came back and saw things while they were deployed that shouldn't have to. They believed toxic fumes that they shouldn't have had to. And that's on us because we said when they signed the dotted line that if you sign here, we're going to take care of you when you get back home if there are any health problems arisen by your service to this country. And, and we've tried to do that with the Toxic Exposure Bill called the PACT Act. We're trying to make sure that we're getting the doctors and nurses we need to take care of the vets so when they come in, you got a veteran that needs help, oftentimes several things wrong with them you got folks that understand those challenges and move forward. And I would just say this, Joel, and I think you probably know this, but uh, the folks who work in these VA clinics, incredible professional people, and they're there because they love the veteran and they go the extra mile to try to serve them. 
There are a few bad apples, but they're few and far between, and we need to make sure we continue to improve upon that workforce that the VA has. You know, Senator, Abby and I have been going on honor flights uh, for yep. a while now, and all you need to do is, you know, go with these old guys. Yep. And I'm, I say old in a in a nice way, yep. and, and hear the stories, and it's all you need. Uh, yep. when, when, they, when they tell their stories finally, yep. and they feel comfortable telling them, it, it shows why people like you are motivated. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Look, I, 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 when I was a junior in high school, the end of the Vietnam War, my, I saw how they treated those folks. We treated those folks. The American people treated those folks, and they came back home. Through no fault of their own. When I got appointed to the VA committee, we had a Vietnam veteran said, I just come out of the woods, and he literally just come out of the woods. And he said, I want to give you some input. He says, I want you treating this generation of veterans like you treated us. I've always remembered that statement. I always visualize that guy every time that I vote on a bill to help our veterans. Why? Because I want to do right by our veterans. We have an all-volunteer military. If we're going to continue to have an all-volunteer military, we need to make the next generation of kids who might sign up know that if you serve, we got your back. Yeah. Senator, we're about out of time. I get that. I understand it. But uh, the problem I see it that you have in your re-election bid is you're too much like uh, the average Montana. You know, you could walk in, have a beer in a pub, and they might not know who you are for a while, you know, <laughs> so, to stick out. I mean, they're going to pour tons of money against you. There's they're no doubt gonna, about it. You know, and, and to beat somebody that's back home, grassroots, you know, that isn't always the the, the modern politician, for lack of a better way of putting it. Well, I was, I was lucky. I was born to good parents who happened to farm in north central Montana, and my two older brothers didn't want to farm, so I got to. <laughs> and along the way, we got involved in school board and soil conservation, and pretty soon the state legislature, and that led to the U.S. Senate. But I am incredibly blessed to be able to serve the people of Montana the United States Senate. There's a lot of important issues that come down the pipe, and we're fighting for rural America every step of the way, whether that's rural America, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, wherever it might be. Uh, there's more work to be done. You know, our democracy is something that I never, ever thought would be at risk. It's at risk. And we need to make sure that we continue to make good decisions like our fathers and forefathers did for us. So there's opportunity for our kids and our grandkids. You know, Senator, thanks for the time before you have to go put up hay. Uh, you, uh, you know, go get them now. Appreciate it. And uh, always thanks uh, to have you on News and Views. Appreciate you it. Thanks, Joel. Senator John Tester, ladies and gentlemen.